Hello, physics fans. It's Mr. G here today to talk about a really important topic in the world of physics, certainly within astronomy, and it's this idea of light and sound. Uh, what we know about the universe is it's extremely vast, and because of that, we can't get to any of these objects. And the only way we can observe objects like stars is to actually look at their light and know properties about the light that allow us to infer ideas like temperature and composition. So when we get into these ideas, keep in mind that based upon these topics that you're learning right now, astronomers have been able to discover pretty much the majority of all major discoveries that we've ever had in astronomy. So the first thing we'll do is we'll point out that we have the electromagnetic spectrum. This is a big, big, big star beside it. And why is that? Because you guys need to know uh, the order in which these go in, and more importantly, the order according to frequency or the order according to wavelength. Now, if you notice on the left side of the electromagnetic spectrum, we're dealing with low frequency or low wave or longer wavelength uh, waves. And we start off with the longest and lowest, the idea of radio waves. Now, I don't want you to confuse this with sound waves. Sound waves are a completely different idea. Sound travels at the speed of sound, whereas radio travels at the speed of light. That is definitely the largest difference between the two, besides the fact that some are transverse waves, the other are longitudinal waves. These are all transverse waves here in light. And one of the important things to to know about light is that it can propagate through any medium um, from a vacuum up until whatever. Sound on the other hand cannot do so. If you try to make a sound in a vacuum you get nothing because it has to be able to interact with the medium and if there is no medium then it won't go anywhere. Now looking at the spectrum here the important thing to notice is which ones are longer and which ones are shorter. So if you see radio waves, we move up the spectrum, you start to run into microwave and infrared waves. These are again considered on the red side of the spectrum. The reason being is because red is indicative of longer wavelengths, whereas blue is considered shorter wavelengths. So if we take a look within the visible, you'll notice that on the left side of the spectrum in 700 nanometers, it's all red, and everybody in this class, I would imagine, knows Roy G. Biv explains the order in which you see the colors in a rainbow. Well, wouldn't you know, that's also the order of the wavelengths, because up at the violet, now we're getting into the ultraviolets, and we're getting into the blue shift type um, waves. So all of a sudden, out of the visible, which by the way is an extremely small, narrow band that we can see, we start getting into the ultraviolet and the x-rays. UV rays, everybody knows about those during the summer because that's what you're putting suntan lotion on to protect yourself from. X-rays, if anybody's ever had a broken bone, you've had an X-ray before. Extremely toxic to you, but given at the extremely low doses that they give you in a hospital, uh, you're probably not going to die. Gamma rays, on the other hand, which are the highest frequency and shortest wavelength type of radiation, uh, you don't want to get around this stuff. This stuff is just going to flat out kill you. And you definitely see gamma rays uh, being emitted from objects like supermassive black holes, for example. So this is the spectrum as we know it. Uh, the key feature, again, is that from left to right, it's a lower frequency to higher frequency, and from left to right, it's longer wavelength to shorter wavelength. As long as you know those connections, you're going to be okay. And depending on what medium you go through, this radiation is going to go at the speed of light. Now, the key feature here is the speed of light changes depending on which medium you are in. And the general idea is that the more dense a medium is, the slower the light is going to go. So you can think of something like light going through air versus light going through a very, very dense cloud of gas. Um, in that case, it's going to slow down a little more there. But when you're moving through a vacuum, the speed of light is a very consistent 3.0 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. And we give this number the title of the universal speed limit because until now, this is September the 6th, 2014, uh, nothing can go faster than light. Uh, we've tried many different things, including particle accelerators. We have tried uh, looking at different objects in space, and we've yet to find anything that goes faster than the speed light. Uh, there is an example of a massless particle called a neutrino, which can go the speed of light, but again, 
uh, it's not going faster than the speed of light. So let's talk about how we might uh, use this information to calculate something. So let's say that the sun is 1.5 times 10 to the 8 kilometers from the earth. How long does it take for light from the sun to reach us? Now most of us already know uh, a ballpark answer in this case, but let's actually calculate this out right. There is no acceleration, so we can use uniform motion. Velocity equals distance over time. We know the distance, we don't know the time, so let's solve for time. Time is equal to distance over velocity, which is equal to 1.5 times 10 to the 11 meters. Notice how I did the conversion for you. Divided by 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. And you're going to get an answer of 500 seconds, which you can convert to 8.3 minutes. So ladies and gentlemen, if for some reason the sun was ever to explode, which by the way it can't, uh, we would have 500 seconds of absolute bliss before we would suddenly perish. So uh, keep that in mind. Uh, and be happy about that concept. By the way, for those of you that are thinking of ever taking astronomy, this particular distance has a title called an AU. It's an astronomical unit. So you'll notice a lot of astronomy textbooks will use AU as a distance instead of this large distance in kilometers because it just makes the math a little simpler to read. So let's try this with a different question. Now let's say we're dealing with the nearest star to our solar system. Obviously some of you might go, oh, oh it's the sun. Sure. The star that is not in our solar system happens to be Alpha Centauri. Uh, again, some of you might know that it's actually a Centauri system where there's also the star Proximus Centauri that at certain points uh, is actually closer than Alpha Centauri. But for the sake of argument, let's just go with this. And we know that it is 4.07 times 10 to the 13 kilometers away. And let's ask how long does it take light to travel from Alpha Centauri to us? Well, again, we can use the same equation that we did before, and we can plug in our values times 10 to the 16 meters, you're welcome, divided by 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, and you end up with 136 million seconds. And what does that convert to? Well, that converts to about 4.3 years. So there's a unit that we give to this. We're actually finding out how long does it take light to travel to us and we came up with a number of 4.3 years. Well the unit that we will actually use to this, to talk about this distance is a light year. So in this case we know that this distance is equivalent to 4.3 light years. Now when we're talking about the visible spectrum we have to remember that the order of visible light from longer wavelength to shorter wavelength is Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Different colors of light have different wavelengths, as I've suggested, and frequencies. And much like the electromagnetic spectrum, you'll notice again, when we go from the red to the blue, the red has longer wavelengths, and the blue has shorter wavelengths, which means purple or violet is going to have a shorter wavelength than red. But conversely, red is going to have a lower frequency then violet. Violet's also going to have a higher frequency. So again, these connections within the visible as well as the electromagnetic spectrum are super important for you. Now something magical happens when you energize matter. And what's going to happen is it's actually going to emit this energy as electromagnetic radiation. Um, some of you may be like, well, what are you talking about? Well, you've seen this before in a classroom for sure. Whenever we've put those neon bulbs in front of you and ask you to look at it with a spectroscope, what you get is these broken up lines which we call atomic spectra. And each element has a unique set of frequencies uh, depending on what element it is. And based on this, we are able to learn something about the composition of an object that is emitting this electromagnetic radiation. If you want an example, well, take a look at this fire right here. You notice how there's some blue and there's some reddish sort of yellow, well that tells us something about the composition of the fire. Uh, something more dear to our hearts is perhaps the idea of colored fireworks. The fact that they know when they energize a certain element it's going to give off a certain color and based on that uh, fireworks artists are able to create all these fancy shows with all these unique uh, color patterns. 
Now, within astronomy, uh, we're more interested in looking stuff like this. This is, again, our atomic spectra. At the bottom I'll explain in a second. And if we label what these are, if we took a look at hydrogen, we would see just a few distinct discrete lines, whereas mercury has something different, and of course neon has something different again. These are unique to these elements, which means if we see these, we know that there is hydrogen in a star, or there is neon in a galaxy, for that matter. Now, the bottom one, well, it looks completely opposite. It looks like it essentially emits a continuous spectrum with the example of very, very few absorption lines. Well, this is something that we call a black body. And in astronomy, black body is almost the standard uh, bar that we measure uh, the emitted radiation of a star on based on the theory that the star is a black body or it absorbs completely and conversely emits completely. And what's the purpose behind that? Well, let's say we take a look at this object right here, which is clearly heated it is going to emit uh, what we call a black body or a Planck's uh, radiation curve. And what we're going to see is we're going to see a cool looking curve like this. And what you'll notice is that based upon the temperature of the object, we can find out something about its relative power output. So the temperature tells us something very unique. And you'll also notice that the wavelength uh, it peaks at different wavelengths, and that's something very unique as well. So based upon how much energy is being absorbed into this black body, we can determine some physical properties. And that was completely useful to Hertzsprung and Russell, who came up with this here, which is the, called the HR diagram. And what this is, is this is actually a map of stars over the course of their lifetime uh, from birth to death. Keep in mind, of course, that this particular diagram does not take into account the idea of a black hole. However, if you take a look, we have a graph here showing temperature on the horizontal axis and absolute magnitude on the vertical axis. Absolute magnitude is something that imagine having every star a certain distance away from the Earth. What would that star look like? How bright would it be? Because, of course, all the stars are different distances away. So some may look brighter, but they may also look closer. Uh, if you bring them all to this theoretical distance away from the Earth, which is called 10 parsecs, uh, we actually can come up with something called an absolute magnitude. Oddly enough, the Sun uh, is relatively bright. If you take a look at this here, well, you'll notice that based upon temperature and absolute magnitude, you'll notice that down here, uh, at the very beginning of a star's life, you're going to be uh, very low magnitude and you're going to be quite uh, cool. However, as you move up this, which is called the main sequence, as you move up it, you're going to increase in brightness and at the same time increase in temperature, whereas you get up here into the blue giants, uh, blue stars, of course, being the hottest uh, stars in the galaxy. Now, these over here, the red supergiants, uh, that's the example of a star that is running out of fuel and it's starting to die and as a result it's actually going to cool down but at the same time it's not going to emit any less light because it is also growing in size. It's trying to exhaust its last fuel. Down here at the bottom while well, we have white dwarfs and what these are, these are near the end of a star's life. This is where they've exhausted all the fuel, they've collapsed back in on themselves and what you end up with is a very small not luminous, but extremely hot star because all the matter now has collapsed in on itself and instead of collapsing all the way down into something and perhaps exploding into a supernova or continuing to collapse into a black hole, the star was small enough that it just nestles in to a white dwarf. So this entire thing here explains the lifespan of a star and it's an incredible achievement of astronomy and it works in the majority of cases. Now this is an example of regular sized stars. If you get up into the supermassive type stars, uh, you find that their actions are much more volatile and there's a slightly adapted version of this that you would now have to take into account. But either way, the important thing is we can see this light. And how do we see light? Well, it's simple. 
the object emits light, it's white light. It's going to reflect off of an object or a material. And what's going to happen is it's going to absorb some of the light and it's going to reflect some of the other light. In our case, we're looking at our dear friend Mr. Rogers here and the white light hits his sweater and it only reflects red light, which means the rest of the light has been absorbed. So if you look at something like a black shirt, uh, the light has been absorbed as opposed to a white shirt in which most of the light has been reflected. This is why wearing a white shirt out in a sunny day uh, is more beneficial to you than a black shirt because it won't absorb as much light. And again, it goes into our eyeball and it does all this fancy biology stuff, but hey, I'm a physicist, so I don't even want to talk about that. Which brings us to our second type of wave that we're going to talk about today, and that's this idea of sound. Now, something important to remember about sound, of course, is it's not like light. It does not travel in transverse waves. It travels in longitudinal waves. And these longitudinal waves of pressure will stimulate our eardrum. Now, anybody who has ever stood beside a large speaker at a concert or has subwoofers in the back of their car or even just little speakers in their doors uh, they'll notice if they put their hands up to it, you feel the actual air moving uh, beside it. And what is that? Well, that's actually the sound propagating through the air. Now, the speed of sound depends on the medium that it goes through. Uh, the important feature here is it has to have a medium to travel through. Sound cannot travel through a vacuum. Uh, so again, any sci-fi movie you've seen where they made sound in space, it's just a lie. The speed of sound depends on the medium. So the more dense the medium is, as opposed to light that slows down, the sound is actually going to travel faster because it's going to interact more aggressively with that medium. Now, pitch is determined by the frequency. Uh, we've all heard people that are way off pitch, uh, and obviously as they go higher in uh, note, uh, their chances of getting off pitch is even more extreme. And let me tell you, we all know how enjoyable that is. Uh, with sound, volume is determined by the amplitude. So you guys will remember when we talked about the basic ideas behind waves, where it's amplitude, where it's frequency. These ideas play a, a crucial role in how we create sound and how we determine whether a sound can be improved or if it's what it's going to be. Now one of the neat effects that we can observe from sound waves is this idea of the Doppler effect. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to imagine a spider on the water. So here's our spider and he's on the water jumping up and down, straight up and down. Well, what's going to happen? Well, he's going to create wave fronts. And these wave fronts are going to be essentially concentric circles the same wavelength in all directions. Okay? Just like that. And this is just a spider jumping up and down. Anybody who's ever dropped a droplet of water in a cup before, or maybe even watched Jurassic Park to see those beautiful concentric circles, that's basically what we're talking about. These waves are coming out, same shape, same wavelength, and away we go. But now imagine that the bug is moving in a direction. Let's say the bug is traveling this way at some velocity. Well, what's going to happen is the waves are going to start bunching up in the direction that it's traveling. So now all of a sudden, instead of concentric circles, what you're going to see is this bunching up occur right in front of the spider. And conversely, behind it, you're going to see this wavelength grow behind it. So if you're standing at the back where the spider is, let's put the dreaded eyeball of science in the back, what are you going to see? Well, all of a sudden you're going to see that these larger wavelengths and these lower frequencies are having an effect on what the observer sees. So if it's sound, you're going to actually hear something that's lower frequency. So the pitch is going to change. If you're in front of the spider, what's going to happen? You're going to see something with a higher frequency. And what's that going to result in? It's going to result in a higher pitch. And you all have experienced this before, and that's with this idea of a train. If the train is just sitting there and it's not moving and it blows its whistle, you're going to hear this very loud, obnoxious whistle blow. 
But if the train is driving by you, uh, what are you going to hear? Well, you're going to hear this incredibly high-pitched whistle until it blows by you, and then you're going to hear it elongate into this big wow kind of sound. Um, what's happening there is you are actually experiencing the Doppler effect in real life because now what's happening, the source of the emitted sound is actually moving away from you and you've switched from being in front of that object to behind it so you actually experience the entire gamut of frequency shift. It's really quite amazing. And that is exactly the way that astronomers were able to determine whether objects were moving towards us or away from us and that's the idea that the Doppler effect also occurs in light waves and if we have here this star right there depending on where we're sitting it's either going to shift towards the blue or shorten the wavelength or it's going to shift towards the red and lengthen the wavelength so depending on whether we see this shift towards the red or the blue will tell us whether objects are moving towards us or away from us and what we've discovered of course is that all the objects are moving away from us which is one of the key features in our explanation that the universe is actually expanding uh, at a particular velocity which we found out recently uh, is increasing because there's actually acceleration that can't be explained so all of this was determined just by knowing something as simple as the change in wavelength that occurs when an object is in motion. So I've told you about light waves and I've told you about sound waves. You need to know the properties of each, what they propagate in, more importantly the frequencies and wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum as well as this cool idea here, the Doppler effect and how it affects light and sound uh, in detail. Okay, so good luck to you and we'll talk to you again.